got two or three patients, I need to manage all of them. Yeah. Now, our small aircraft can carry two stretched patients. And if there's no doctor, we might have a, or we can have a sitter as well as a doctor. So just say an amputated thumb can sit in a chair. Our jet carry three stretched patients and you can have two sitters. It gets busy when you've got three yeah, or five critical patients. Yeah, patients. They've all got different needs, there's different things going on. So it all comes down to preparing for each flight. If I'm going with the doctor, then we don't really know what we're facing. Sometimes what you read on the paper is not always what the story actually is. Mm. We always know how to plan. Like I said before, you do this, I'll do this. If this happens, we'll do A, B, C, D. Or if A doesn't work, B, and so on. If you don't have a, pl- a plan in place, I think that's when things can go wrong. And I guess it's in the hospital environment. They might put an airway in a patient and if that airway doesn't go in, then what's the, the next plan? It's, it's safe for you. And I think it makes it, everyone knows what they're doing when there's a plan in place for the patient safety and for us to have things flow logically. I think if I didn't plan, I would probably stress out a little bit more. So for me, I'm definitely a planner. I like to be organized and that might be getting some equipment out, equipment out or drugs prepared. If I don't use them, that's fine. I'll just discard the drugs and repack my bags and repack the aircraft. You don't want to be scrounging around in an emergency situation, finding equipment and drugs, trying to drop yeah. when there's just two of these. It, yeah. It's not a good situation to be in. So preparation is the key and mm-hmm. communication for me personally. And can you still communicate to ground level or to the doctor on the ground through the aeroplane? Yes, we've while got you're a traveling? SAT, we yeah. do. We have a SAT phone. Okay. So we can phone through to the operations centre and then be put through to the doctor as well. Or you can be put through to anyone, even the hospital where you're going, just to get an update or... Talk to some, yeah. yeah. Or if we have to set off in a hurry and we haven't got the paperwork through, it can be emailed through or ops can phone us and discuss things the phone or the receiving hospital might ring and say, hey, he's he's now been intubated or so then we can start to prepare from our end. Something slightly different going on. Because things do change in those environments. Things change very, very quickly. Oh, patients yeah. deteriorate. Patients get better. It's always a nice surprise when you show up somewhere and they're much better than what the piece of paper, what you've read on the piece of paper. The miracle of drugs and, and nursing care. Correct. So you talked about logically then, what about emotionally? Going into a situation, not everybody likes to go into a situation where they don't quite know what to expect. I mean, you can read everything about that patient, but there's the human side of that patient as well yeah. that might be unexpected. How do you deal emotionally with that or situations that have just gone a bit skewed? I think I'm my background's mainly adults. Obviously, doing this job for the last couple of years, I've been picking up children, babies from different parts of the state. I have come into some confronting situations and I'm a parent myself. It has been something that I've probably gone home and thought about, some of the things I've probably witnessed and some of the injuries and things that I've picked up. I obviously put that patient at the forefront, get them to Perth, and I try not to think about think about what's happened and until I'm home and I've handed that patient over safely. Yeah. It has been quite emotional at times because it's not something I'm used to. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not, I haven't worked at a children's hospital. Um, and some of the unfortunate rural and remote communities, there is huge disparities in healthcare and standards of living and things like that. Mm-hmm. So it has been a challenge. I think I'm getting better now. But it's not always it's not always an easy thing to pick up children with injuries that probably shouldn't be they probably shouldn't have those injuries and things like that. It's the nature of our work. We pick up people from premature babies to the very elderly mm-hmm. and everyone in the middle. I, I don't really know how to explain that. It, it's it's been challenging, and I have picked up things that I didn't that didn't sit with me well as a parent. But who but, do you talk to, or how do you deal with that emotionally? Like you can't possibly go home and talk to your partner. No, and, he doesn't and, understand. No, they don't understand. Generally, we have I have chatted to the doctor that I might be on, in the flight with. We've sort of talked about it. Mm-hmm. But those sort of emotional type scenarios, I probably haven't really spoken too much about. I think I've compartmentalized just put it to the side, maybe. Yeah, and hope that I don't have to witness that again. Yeah. So that's been tricky for me. I can handle all the blood, guts, trauma, but when things happen, 
unfortunate things happen to people. Psychologically. It's been something that probably I wasn't prepared for at the start of this, my flight nurse journey. We get very good at compartmentalising, putting things into little boxes in our brain and just close that lid and hope it doesn't come back out, don't we? And Correct. But there's certain things that you keep that box lid shut down and you hope it never has to open and deal with it again, yes. don't you? Yeah. I hope that some of the things I have witnessed, I don't want to witness again. But in the back of my mind, I know when I go out to the remote communities, might be something that I might witness, I might see again. And th- I- is that where you've got good camaraderie with your officers or your people in the Royal Flying Doctors services yeah, that can help you with that? Uh, they've all witnessed it themselves. Correct, absolutely. It's not an isolated thing. Like everyone's witnessed things that they, over their long-term career, that they, no one wants to witness. No. It's one of those things. But we know, the supports, we're very well supported. Um So that's definitely not an issue. I just, I think it makes it hard when you're a mother herself and you've got young children and it's, and you witness things that you don't want to witness. No, I I agree. And you are in awe that people can be treated like that or in awe that people can live in certain conditions that we would never expect. Absolutely. And it is, some of these situations are very confronting. The alcohol, drug fueled, related violence, it's out there. But unfortunately, I think some of it just gets brushed under the carpet. Um, mm. So as long as I can pick that person up, that little person or big person, and bring them, give safely. them the best care I can, and then get them to Perth. Unfortunately, you never know what happens to these people. Mm. You don't the time, have that follow up. No, no. Paul alluded to that too. He said that you don't always get to see what happens to them later. No, so you never know. You're left wondering. A few, a few of our patients are probably what I'd call a frequent flyer. I've picked up quite a few multiple times mm. Um, mm. and they never forget your face. No. And it's really lovely that they, they remember who you are and they remember the care that you gave them and how you made them feel and I think that's probably really important. There will always be someone that will, will remember you and the impact that you had oh, on their lives. Hell yeah. I've been out in a social situation and people have come up to me and said I've nursed them. It, you don't understand the when, impact yeah, that you have on people. It's quite warming when they do remember you. Mm. At their most vulnerable time, you know, these people are coming from their, away from their families mm. or they've lived in the country their whole life. They're coming with just a small bag of belongings, not much, mm. no family. So you're there to keep them safe and make them feel safe. That's their trauma moment in life that you never forget. We remember trauma and we remember great times. I spent many hours flying back from lots of places with elderly people, you know, they might be confused or dementia, broke, fractured hip, whatever. And I've just had their, their hand in my hand and just held them because that's, all, that's all they need. I can't mm. I can monitor them, but I just need to get them from A to B. And it's that, I don't forget those moments. Where is the longest places or the furthest away point place that you've been to? I took a little boy to Melbourne. He was... Returning to Melbourne where he lived, but had been overseas and re- repat basically to Perth, he had a new cancer diagnosis. Okay. So I've taken him there. I also went to Christmas in Cocos Island all in the one night. There and back. Yes, there and back. <laughs> How many hours would that be? I think it took us 17 hours. <laughs> we went to Christmas Island for a P1, so it's quite urgent. Yeah. And then we're on the ground in Christmas Island, got diverted to Cocos Island for another P1. So we left the we had to leave this, the least sickest P1 and to get the sickest P1. Mm-hmm. So about 17 hours, that one. I took a patient to Darwin who yep. resided in Darwin but was in WA. And then that same night I found two more to bring back from Darwin. <laughs> Roll up, do they feed you on the plane? No, we take, we've got, we all have an esky. We've always got hot water. We've always got lots of foods. The pilots love snacks. Some of the doctors love snacks. We've always got lots of food. Um some hospitals send out lots of sandwiches and fruit and biscuits. Oh, isn't that good? And the lovely volleys, particularly a few places, they love stocking their fridge full of chocolates and yeah. juice boxes and things like that. And they love it. I'm very, I pack well. I've always got lots of food and nibbly. Yeah. There. But with, yeah. there's no toilet on the aircraft, so you've got to be cautious of how much you're drinking. I wonder whether to ask you that earlier, like the, the day-to-day things. If you're doing like even a four-hour flight to, in Melbourne, 
Yep, I've had to learn to hold my bladder and not drink as much as I normally do. <laughs> and but your patient, body still siphons through. So oh, I have to. Yeah, I have been busting many, many times. Yeah, and I've learned how to bush wee as well, <laughs> which to my disgust, but I have learned how to do it. Yep. There's not toilets everywhere we land. Or if there is a toilet in some of these remote places, you have to look for spiders and snakes, frogs, <laughs> the works. Yeah. I have been seen running out of these places screaming many times. <laughs> Your pants the pilot down knows around where I'm running out for. <laughs> um, Stop. Yeah. So yeah. It, yes, it is. Those are the challenges. Obviously, we have no fridge, no facilities, so to speak, just our eskies. But yeah, we all, yeah. we never starve, put it that way. That's good. And I, you kind of eat on your dead leg. Don't, you're too busy when you've got the patience. So your dead leg means? Dead leg would mean on my way to retrieve a person without a patient on the aircraft. So I can do reading, study. Okay. Um, so the patient's not there. No patient. Good. Listen to a podcast. Just bits and pieces to make the time go by quite fast. But yes, it's quite, I always have to think, have we got a fuel stop? Yes or no? Have I got, if there's have a fuel got time stop, to go I can the go toilet. to the toilet. If I yeah. can't. And it's the same, there's no toilet for the patient. So we're yeah. trying to put a bedpan on a tiny little stretcher in an aircraft is really quite difficult. <laughs> We've got some gel, like kitty litter gel, basically. So you, if they need to use the bottle or the pan, you put the kitty litter in, it will solidify and yeah. then you put it in a bag. Yeah. But it's not the most. We've got no curtains to close around them. So it is tricky. A lot of the patients do have catheters. And Thank I'll, goodness. You know, if they don't, I'm like, do you need to go to the toilet? No, I don't need to go. I said, just give it a go because there's no toilet on the aircraft. Can we put a nappy on you instead? Some of them do, like the elderly you mm. Know, mm. might be in contact. They might have a nappy on. That's the ins and outs that people don't realise, that, you know, the, the bodily functions, we're, we're so vulnerable. We're there in a small and close environment with two strangers as a patient. And you have to be very careful because all the avionics are on the floor of the aircraft. You don't want anything spilling or pouring out, getting wet. Oh, because we'd so be in trouble by the pilot. Because they can't navigate. I don't know what the effect, but if, all the con- avionic connections are in the floor somehow. That's as far as I know about that side of it. <laughs> but I think the pilot will tell me off of we spilled you- a half a liter of urine uh-uh. on the floor. <laughs> so always again, plan ahead. Get them to go to the toilet before you you know load yeah. them onto the aircraft. Well, yeah. they're all Just little, little things. bits and pieces. They're little things, things. exactly. We could prepare for the big things like the stemmies and the hearts and lungs and oxygen and everything like that, but it's that little thing. And if the know, patient's starving hungry and their stomach's rumbling and they want to fart in front of you. Or, exactly. And, you know, you're flying, you might be flying to, to Cardinara and it's 45 degrees and you try and load the patients up. It's hot. You're sweating. sweating there's yeah. flies everywhere. Even if it's the middle of summer, I still carry a jacket because we go to some places, you might be in the desert in the middle of the night, it is freezing cold. It is. So, and you, and you can change in an instant. That's the beauty of this job. It's unpredictable. It's probably what I love about it. I'm not stuck in those four hospital walls. I've seen more of Western Australia than I ever thought I would. The it's beauty. definitely a privilege to have this job, to be able yeah. to pick up those most vulnerable people and Did- see the beauty of yeah. Can you tell us, is there an age limit to, to hiring people to nurses? So if somebody's been nursing for 20 years and they're just tired of ward work? No, ab- no, absolutely not. As long as you've got the qualifications. Yep. So there's opportunities for people out there, absolutely. maybe mid-40s, mid-50s, who want to get out and just see yes. something different. Because we do get tired of our routine sometimes. The beauty of the career is that we can move from different avenues all the time. We definitely have some older nurses. They love it. Yeah. And we have some younger nurses. Yeah. I mean, I'm 39, almost 39. So I'm not too young, but yep. I wouldn't say age is a limit. As long as you can pass your physical test, your pre appointment medical, your fitness, it's quite a physical test. Do you have to run? I think I did in the medical, lots of planking, push-ups, carrying heavy boxes. Because don't forget, you, the walkway in the aircraft is very small. So yeah. You've got to be able to fit through and squat down and get in nooks and crannies. So you were talking about COVID. How did it come around wanting to do the flying doctors? Did you knew that that's something you wanted to go down to and you applied? You said 
that you just put your name down. So I and think it came about. obviously WA was expecting a huge COVID surge and needed to basically bolster their work. 